This is Port Stories, brought to you by the Ports Past and Present Project. Sharing stories from five ports in Ireland and Wales. Dublin, Rosslare, Hollyhead, Fishguard and Pembroke Dock. Project funded by the European Regional Development Fund through the Ireland-Wales Cooperation Programme. My name is Clara Connolly from University College Cork, and I'm here with my colleagues, uh, Dr. Rita Singer from Aberystwyth University and Dr. James Louis Smith, uh, also from University College Cork. The three of us are involved in a project named Ports Past and Present. Uh, the project is funded by the European Regional Development Fund via the Ireland Wales programme. And essentially the project concerns itself with the cultural heritage of the port towns in the Irish Sea Basin, the currently functioning port towns. And it thinks about how the cultural heritage of those towns and the wider cultural heritage of the Irish Sea, the crossings back and forth over millennia, how that might be put to use uh, for tourism, um, the ways in which um, a deeper engagement and a wider knowledge of history might promote tourism. And there are some tensions there and that's some of the things we're going to talk about. So um, it would be impossible to begin a talk about Gothic strangeness at the coast and the Irish Sea in particular without thinking a little bit about Frankenstein, um, Mary Shelley's Gothic novel. Some of you will remember that when northeasterly winds carry Victor Frankenstein from the Orkneys to the coast of Ireland, uh, Mary Shelley asks readers to imagine islands joined by sea, buffeted by wind and weather. Victor's skiff has to battle with the prevailing southwesterly winds, navigate treacherous currents and so on. But actually only two contemporary reviewers made anything of the novel's Irish scenes or paid any attention um, to the Irish scenes. And one of those reviewers was Percy Bysshe Shelley, whose anonymous review of his wife's um, novel admired its originality, but found only one instance in which um, he wrote, we detect the least approach to imitation. And the imitation that he dictated was in relation to his father-in-law's novel, Mary Shelley's father's novel, uh, Caleb Williams, or Things As We Are, William Godwin's novel um, in, of the 1790s, in which the accused hero tries to kind of bend his course to Ireland, hoping to find a sucker there, um, but, but not, because of course for Godwin, Ireland is fatally entangled with Britain, a place of less security than most other countries from which it is divided by sea, um, as um, the narrator says in Caleb Williams. And it's that image of a kind of an insecure island shadowed by injustice and the kind of dark shadows that are cast within the literature and the culture of Irish sea crossings uh, that we're going to talk about today. And um, a few examples just to sort of um, set the scene beginning with this um, literary culture of Gothic is, is what I'm going to uh, talk about before passing on to my colleagues. Um, one way of looking at it is to think about the way in which a very kind of mundane aspects of sea crossing, the mail boat, for example, plying back and forth in extremely routine ways for most of a, a, a century is often described as kind of strange or uncanny. Uh, so in Summer of Lynn Ross's 1894 novel, The Real Charlotte, there's a sort of very full and kind of sensational chapter that sees uh, the mail boat docking um, uh, and the description there is um, kind of almost from beneath looking up at the mail boat and seeing its great kind of side size as it, as it approaches the jetty where it's described as moving with the sentient ease of a living thing. Um, and that kind of description is echoed again in Yeats's um, early novel, John Sherman, all from, from the 1890s as well, uh, where the hero is kind of sitting in a rather miserable fashion uh, on top a boat as it crosses from London to Sligo, kind of making its way around the northwest coast by um, Tory Island. Uh, and the ship there is described as this thing crawling slowly along the sea. So they're sort of presentiments uh, and they find a more concrete form of expression in some cultural representations of suicide on the Irish Sea. Um, Yeats's own um, uncle, a, a stockbroker, one of his um, Sligo relations actually committed suicide at sea. And there's a reference to such 
um, a, a possibility in Trollope's novel Phineas Finn, where Phineas is walking, pacing up and down the pier at Dunleary, trying to work out what to do with himself. And there's always the possibility, he says, of kind of shedding one's own self at sea. Now, the tone is light, but there's a kind of resonance with Irish Gothic and what John Brannigan calls the malignant sense of place characteristic of the Irish Sea. So that's what we've been looking at as part of the project. I'm going to pass on now to Rita, who takes us to out of the 19th century and into the 20th, beginning in 1914 with Gothic reporting of the war at sea. Uh, and James follows both with some tragic stories from coastal lighthouses, but also some thoughts on how to tell those stories within the context of public humanities Gothic. Over to you, Rita. Thank you, Claire. In July 1914, Arthur Conan Doyle published his latest story, Danger, in the Strand magazine, where the fictional submariner Captain John Sirius relates his successful war against Great Britain. The story mimics early invasion fiction in which Britain finds itself under attack from nefarious assailants. Until late 1918, the Strand published several short stories in which submarine warfare played a central role. Within a few years, the story shifted in tone from exciting adventure stories a la Conan Doyle to narrating an inward struggle where the British male psyche battles against an unseen and unknowable enemy. The following examples from Welsh newspapers demonstrate that these stories did not exist in a vacuum, but are best understood as artistic responses to German submarine warfare and how it was reported by the press in increasingly gothic terms. Blockading Germany's main ports quickly became a priority for the Royal Navy in World War I. In retaliation, the German Imperial Navy used submarines to terrorise British merchant vessels. By late 1914, the first U-boats were sighted in the Irish Sea, and at the end of January 1915, the first Welsh ships were reported sunk. An early victim of the merchant war was the Linda Blanche, registered at Bangor. She was stopped on 30th of January 1915 by U-21. The first newspapers to report the sinking were Idinesith Cymraeg and the Haverford West, the Milford Haven Telegraph. Whereas the Welsh language newspaper heralds the case as Gorche Siedlonger Germany, German submarines feet, its anglophone cousin strikes a remarkably uneven tone. The report identifies the submariners as pirates, but the sailors' testimonies undercut the violent language, stating that the Germans handed out cigars and even gave advice for a quick rescue. Similar in tone to Conan Doyle's danger, the Welsh press framed the sinking of the Linda Blanche's hijinks at sea. Only with Germany's escalation of the merchant war did the newspapers begin to use the same aggressive language about the war at sea as had hitherto been used or has been reserved for the land war. The sinking of the Falaba by U-28 with the loss of 104 lives in March 1915 was the game changer. The South Wales Weekly Post presents an uncompromising judgment. There is complete agreement on the point that the commander of the enemy submarine and his men behaved more like fiends than human beings. Those guilty of the murder of innocent men and women are outside the pale of consideration as prisoners of war. The report denies the German submariners due justice, as this would only apply to fellow humans. Similarly, the Carmarthen Weekly reporter published a polemic poem in response to the sinking of the Falaba, referring to ghoulish deeds by satanic fiends or Huns for questioning whether Germans were indeed, um, indeed had a soul as their closest allies, the Prince of Darkness, before finally rounding off that blood shall be the Germans' tears. A similar case was the attack on the Apapa by U-96 of Anglesey in November 1917. The North Wales Chronicle reported from the official inquest, but gave it a peculiarly emotional interpretation, tapping into the Gothic trope of being buried alive. Imagine then the courage required to remain in a position down in the bottom of the ship with the water swirling round, knowing that at any moment you may be trapped and all chance of being safe cut off. Whereas in the early war months, German submariners were identified as pirates, covertly drawing inspiration from adventure literature, the later newspaper reports and readers' poetry consistently monster them. In the final year of the war, B. H. Jones of Penacroix published the following England in the Amman Valley Chronicle. Diavle mor yur tanvoren, he veithes, leviathan rechmen, crelon vra de veisiad din, yur slovrith, he slovren. I paraphrase. A sea devil is the submarine, the presumptuous, terrible leviathan of the Germans. A cruel betrayal of, of human inventiveness is this murder device, an ugly coward. Public talk of sea devils, leviathans and demonic forces not only dehumanised the enemy, but also promoted British militarism as the only permissible way forward. 
And with that, I hand over to my colleague, James. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So um, I'm going to be talking a bit about lighthouses and uh, the macabre events that uh, cling to them. So uh, on the Welsh side of our project region in off the coast of Pembrokeshire, uh, on a tiny little set of rocks called the Smalls, and they are really, really small. I encourage you to look it up. Um, this story stands out in our sort of collection of community stories we've gathered as a case study for the intersection of public humanities and the complexities of coastal Gothic and its reception. So the story in question, known as the Smalls Lighthouse tragedy essentially, is um, the, uh, singularly macabre and it's um, that's attested to by the fact that it partially inspired two films, the 2016 British Welsh film starring Mark Lewis Jones and Michael Gibson and the 2019 American film uh, starring Robert Pattinson and Willem Dafoe, both confusingly called The Lighthouse. And um, the, the uh, latter, the 2019 film also has um, a sort of Edgar Allan Poe connection as well for another story. So it's not as directly linked, but both are. And the story is both gruesome and remembered as a tragedy that led to long-term reform. So it was the reason why after 1801, when this event took place, it was the, a legal requirement that lighthouse keepers always be in a team of three minimum. And you will see why in a second, when I read a little passage from um, written for us for a story for our collection, collection by uh, one of our uh, community members. Uh, so in the winter of 1801, two local men, uh, both Thomas, Thomas Griffith and Thomas Howell, took up their tour of duty at the Smalls Lighthouse. Uh, not much information exists about them, except that they were reputed to be on bad terms already. They did not like each other and they were stuck. Uh, on the lighthouse. And when I call it a lighthouse, you're probably thinking of a later Victorian lighthouse with walls. This is not. It is, in fact, a series of sticks driven into um, holes in a rock with a tiny little cabin on top. And they only replaced them in the sort of 19th century with larger, more impressive lighthouses. They were living in close corners and uh, close quarters. And um, during their tour on the lighthouse, Griffith sickened and died after a few days. Um, and the, the corpse became intolerable after living at close quarters for several days, but Howell knew that the finger of suspicion would be pointed at him if he disposed of the body into the sea. He was a cooper by trade, so he used his carpentry skills to cobble together a wooden crate from the bulkhead planking and shoved his companion's body inside and hung it out on the side of the lighthouse. He got rid of the stench, but unfortunately um, the arm of the corpse uh, burst out of the box and started tapping on the window. So the story goes, and it was a minor media sensation uh, when the, the details of this incident came to light. And it's worth noting just the sheer enthusiasm of the community um, and of, you know, popular culture for this story of its sort of singularly macabre nature, um, but also for the fact it's a type of a commemoration and it's part of actually very much part of the history of lighthouse keeping. Um, enthusiasm for these tales echoes through the recorded accounts um, once uh, of similar tales across the region. So, for example, in Ireland, off the coast of Wexford, there's another rock um, just off the, you know, the, the shipping lanes out of Ross Lair uh, called Tusker Rock. And there's a lighthouse there as well. And when that was being built in 1813, we, we learned from reading the school survey of the Irish uh, folklore collection um, that uh, beams were thrown across the rock, uh, connected to it firmly by iron clamps. Uh, there were huts built and erected for 41 workmen. And six weeks afterwards, a terrible storm arose. And some of the men ran naked from their beds to the highest point of the rock. But before the rest could escape, a surge swept the huts away and many men were drowned. And those who escaped were clinging to the rock from Sunday at four o'clock until Wednesday. 
And there were other equally like tragic stories from around then of a ship went down off the rock uh, that would have been saved by the very lighthouse that was under construction at the time, you know, um, and the Tusker Rock is still there now run by the Irish lights. It's um, automated now since I think the, since the late 20th century, but uh, you know, the stories of lighthouses, um, the folklore, the cultural and literary corpora of Ireland and Wales are filled with incidents like these. Um, uh, they're sort of part of this string of incidences around the coastline that Gillian O'Brien, who's written a public history sort of um, about Irish public history, um, she's described it as a, the ring of sorrow encircling Ireland uh, and the wider archipelago, I might add, binding together communities who've suffered maritime tragedies like beads on a rosary. And they form this kind of constantly repeated grim light motif for our project along um, the Wexford coast, along the coast of counties Dublin and Wicklow, you know, along the east coast of Ireland, um, along the Pembrokeshire coast and the Anglesey coast in the north of Wales. Um, there's a ship graveyard off all of those coasts. There are the amount of deaths on in that that region over the centuries is is staggering and it reminds all that interact with these sites that coastal life is shot through with these dark veins of fascination public somewhat morbid fascination the allure the tragedy but also the commemoration and emotional depth of of, de of death at sea and of, of these kind of gothic tales of the coast and yeah, the, the sort of distinct but mirrored Irish and Welsh sets of a Gothic aesthetic. Um, and they're each different, but also part of a sort of global story. Uh, so the question I'm constantly faced with in my role, um, sort of managing these stories, um, you know, stringing them and finding new writers and new topics, is how do tragedies and macabre deaths and their popular imagination and their reception fit into a constructive identity for a community in the future uh, and in the present? Because they, you know, they tell us as much um, of, about a place and its identity as a positive story does, as a like a, you know, we have stories of the first balloon journey over the Irish Sea or the first, um, you know, flight over the Irish Sea, but these are, are equally telling. But they're also grim legacies of the past and their triumphs. They're all, often they're built into that kind of Victorian narrative of technological progress of the building of the lighthouses, which as well as these deaths saved countless lives after their construction. So this early 19th century moment is very much a pivotal moment as well. So they're like natural beauty and death, the kind of two sides of a coin inseparable in Irish and Welsh coastal life. So keeping that balance in tourist, the tourist register of public humanity storytelling um, is complicated and it complicates identity and place, but it also gives voice to an already extant desire for the kind of thrills and chills type of tourism, but also with real social regional patterns and themes and uh, seriousness and, and the culture and the politics of commemoration. So, I mean, they're an excellent um, resource, but there's always the chance of cheapening them at, at the same time. So balancing those two sides of the narrative is crucial. Thanks for listening to our discussion about haunted shores uh, by my colleagues Claire and Rita and myself. Uh, I'm James Louis Smith and I've been the sound engineer for this episode and you can uh, tune in again soon for more Port Stories on our podcast.